So good evening to everybody. Since you all have to run home and make wills and make advanced healthcare directives, I shall try and keep this as brief as possible. Um, and what I'd like to do is just walk through some of the provisions. So we've talked about the fact that there will be legislation. Um, and what I want to do is, thank you, what I want to do is try and give you a flavour for actually what's in there and what's possible and what's not. Um, so as has already been said, this, um, what is out currently for consultation are what we call a set of heads uh, or a general scheme. So it's to set out what it is we intend to do in the legislation. And this will be incorporated into uh, the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Bill um, because it really does fit with this um, issue of capacity and the principles are very similar. So it will go into that bill. So we're all aware of what an advance um, healthcare directive is. Um, and for the current um, legislation, what we have done is, I suppose certainly um, because the, the Hospice Foundation have just done such a great job with advanced healthcare directives, we think of them as being very much an instrument um, uh, of deciding things at end of life. And that's certainly how they have been traditionally used. Um, more recently, they have been used in the area of mental health also, so those people who lose capacity for other reasons um, than, for example, um, a medical catastrophe or something of that nature. But somebody, for example, who may either have um, an ongoing issue with dementia or may have fluctuating capacity, may have something like schizophrenia where if they're on their meds, they're doing very well, etc. So this particular piece of legislation is actually encompassing all of that. We've tried to be as disability neutral as possible and it encompasses both a general health care and mental health care. Um, and at the moment, as you're aware, and I'm really grateful uh, uh, to Sharon and her colleagues for actually giving me the opportunity to discuss this with you tonight, because the legislation is actually out for public consultation at the moment. And we genuinely are really interested in hearing people's views, because obviously we want to get this right, and you're the people who are going to tell us whether we're going to get it right or not. So I would, um, as Liam has already said, I would really encourage people, if you have views in relation to what we're talking about here, and if you go away and read what's on the Department of Health website, please do come back to us um, and let us know your views. We'd be really interested in hearing them. So Patricia touched on this, the purpose of the legislation. Effectively, it's to promote the autonomy of the individual. It's to give people choice to ensure that they are receiving treatments that they do or don't wish to receive and that they can manage end of life issues and indeed more general health issues in a way that actually protects their dignity and autonomy. Um, the other good thing, and I think we've had that kind of outlined to us this evening, is that we hope that an advanced healthcare directive will also serve to actually be a really positive instrument for interacting with those who will actually take care of us at the end of our lives. So the healthcare professionals that we're going to interact with. And it's a way of giving them the information about what our values are and what's important to us and what we'd like to have or not have happen to us at the end of our lives or during our lives. So under this legislation, who can actually make an advanced healthcare directive? Well, uh, basically you have to be an adult. So you have to be 18 years or over. You have to have capacity. Um, so to make it, you have to have capacity, and it only comes into force when you lack capacity, because otherwise they should be asking you the question directly. Um, it must be made voluntarily. So it must be something that is a genuinely expression of your wish, and it's not something you've been coerced into. When this legislation is enacted, there will be no obligation for anybody to make an advanced health care directive. That is absolutely a choice. So those who wish, and there are those people um, who wish not to, to actually engage and, and want other people to make the decision for them. We're not forcing them into that space, but I would echo the sentiments of my colleagues here tonight and say, but actually most of us would like a level of control over what happens to us, and this is the way of exerting that control. So as Patricia has earlier mentioned, the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Bill presumes an individual to have capacity, and that will be the case here. So when you sit down tonight to write your Advanced Healthcare Directive, you will be presumed to have capacity, and someone will have to prove otherwise if, if, if that's the case, if they wish to do that. Um, and an Advanced Healthcare Directive, we've said in the legislation, should be made on the basis of informed decision making. Now what we haven't done, and some other jurisdictions have done, is we haven't said that you in order for your advanced healthcare directive to be valid, that you have to go to a GP or you have to go to a solicitor or so on. I suppose we feel it's very important that people do reflect 
when they're making their advanced healthcare directives, that they do talk to their family doctor, that they do talk to their family members, that that's very important because the best tool, the best set of instructions will actually emerge if you have those discussions. But what we don't want to do is to put um, obstacles in people's way. Um, if you want to make an advanced healthcare directive, it should be as simple as going home tonight, sitting down at the kitchen table and doing it. We don't necessarily want to have some sort of legislative um, onus on you to actually go and seek advice from various different professionals. So that's how it's drafted at the moment. So what does it encompass? What can you do with your advanced healthcare directive? Well, an individual's will and preferences, which is what the assisted decision-making bill, the larger parent bill, if you like, is all about, basically encompasses both treatment and treatment requests and treatment refusals. But it's important for me to make clear that this legislation um, is only really talking about treatment refusals. So it is a treatment refusal which will have the legal standing. So if you refuse the treatment, nobody can force it on you. Now, in the case of a treatment request, so Sharon wants to have her motorcade, and we're all very supportive of her having that. But whether she'll actually get it, not entirely sure, because that's going to depend on a whole load of other things, right? About whether, for example, we think the flowers are more important or whether the motorcade is going to take precedence. So they're going to have to be issues like that. So in essence, what we've tried to do with the legislation is to ensure that your preferences, which are really important, will be taken note of, will be facilitated where possible, but they can't be legally binding in the same way as a treatment refusal will be. Um, the proposed legislation, as has been mentioned, doesn't in any way pertain to euthanasia and assisted suicide. Both of those are not legal in this jurisdiction and therefore you can't ask for something that's not legal. So what we talk about are these criteria around validity and applicability. So when is it going to be valid and when can you apply it? Okay. So since we're really introducing a system here where if you write in your advanced healthcare directive, I do not wish to receive the antibiotics or the CPR or I don't wish to be ventilated, etc. Those are all very, very serious issues. And so you need to be rather clear and specific about the things that you do and you don't want. So we're asking, not that people write it because we're not asking you to get legal advice or medical advice, etc. But we're saying it can be written in very clear layman's terms, but it does need to be clear. So those kind of very sweeping statements about no heroic measures or oh, keep me comfortable at the end or whatever, they're all things that, of course, we understand in our own head, but are going to be very difficult to interpret when we can't actually shake you and say, what exactly did you mean by that? Okay? So we are going to require people to actually be somewhat specific. And I suppose that's where the value of discussing these things with your GP is actually going to come into force. But really, that back and forth to give you some idea. And I think that the Think Ahead tool is excellent in that respect. And I think that, that can really be something that can be utilised in this respect. Um, under the legislation, the Advanced Healthcare Directive has to be in writing and it has to be witnessed. And there are also um, restrictions around who can, for example, witness it. So you need to have two people witness it. They have to be adults. And one of them uh, shouldn't be entitled to any part of your personal estate. And that's the idea that no one's going to be witnessing it and dispatching you off to the never world because they might be in possession of your house or your land or indeed your jewellery. Um, and so these are kind of safeguards that are, we're trying to build into the legislation. So what we have chosen not to do, and there are some jurisdictions who do this, is we haven't placed a mandatory time limit um, for review of your advanced healthcare directive. We would say that it's really important that you review it at regular intervals. People, I mean, you hear this all the time, people might be sitting down with their husband one evening and watching some, some documentary on TV and they see something and go, oh my God, I didn't realize that's how that worked. And they may have a, a change of mind, their values could change due to particular, perhaps they've cared for their own parent and that they've seen how that's panned out. So it's very clear that really if it is to reflect your wishes, you should be reviewing it and reviewing it often. But we don't feel that it's appropriate to say, well, in the legislation, it will become invalid if you don't review it within a year or three years or five years. Because we don't know how often people's preferences do change. And for example, I could make it today and it might be equally valid in 20 years time. It might not. So our code of practice is going to deal with that, but we don't think it's appropriate that in the legislation we should force you to rewrite the same thing every three years or indeed something different. 
Um, an individual can revoke or alter their advanced health care directive. So, for example, if you have written it and you want to change something about it, or indeed you just want to revoke it completely, you can do that. But again, you have to have capacity to do that. Otherwise, there's no real point in making one in the first place. Um, there are a couple of areas where advanced health care directives are not going to be legally binding, and there are good reasons for that, and maybe we can talk about that in the questions afterwards, but I don't want to get into too much depth. But um, So those individuals with mental health difficulties who are involuntarily detained under Section 4 of our 2001 Mental Health Act, um, their wishes will be taken into consideration, but they won't necessarily, their treatment refusals won't necessarily be um, legally binding in the same way as for um, uh, uh, the rest of the particular piece of legislation. Also those who are detained under the Criminal Law and Sanity Act. Um, and then there are restrictions as well on the applicability of an advanced health care directive during pregnancy. And this is the idea that there's a third party whose interests you also need to interact with. So we can, happy to take questions in relation to that. There's also a section in there about the liability of healthcare professionals. So if a healthcare professional um, is acting on good faith and they, they either comply with your healthcare directive, which says, please switch me off, don't give me the, don't give me the antibiotic, don't, give me the, don't ventilate me, whatever, they don't need to worry about finding themselves up in the High Court for, in fact, manslaughter or anything else. They, they, they will be protected by this piece of legislation in that they have simply done what you've asked them to do. And the other thing is, let's say you do have an advanced healthcare directive and that says, switch me off, don't ventilate me, etc. And the healthcare professional isn't actually in possession of that for whatever reason, and we'll talk about that, then they also can't be um, uh, uh, liable, um, because that's important too. They need to be protected in that respect. As Patricia mentioned, we also have um, a patient-designated healthcare representative. And this is because we recognise that with the best will in the world, none of us are going to be able to go home tonight and write an advanced healthcare directive that will cover absolutely every eventuality, every situation. Um, it's simply not possible, and, and clinical medicine is just too complex for that. So effectively, what we want people to do is to cover the principles, as I say, in as much specific, clear language as they can, but we also recognise that sometimes decisions will have to be made. And so we've provided for the person themselves to choose somebody, a trusted third party. And believe me, we, we do know that the patient-designated healthcare representative is a very awkward phrase. There are reasons. We, if anybody there, um, I'd love to say there's a competition running, but if anybody else has another clever way of putting it, please do send it in to us, because we know it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit awkward. Um, uh, but you can appoint this person literally in your advanced health care directive and say, I would like my husband or I'd like my daughter or I'd like whoever, a trusted friend to act as my patient designated representative. And they will be there to either interpret your advanced health care directive. So if the doctor is saying, well, I'm not entirely clear what she meant by this, you can say, well, look, knowing her as I did and based on her will and preferences, I think this is what she meant or even to make that decision knowing, again, the type of values that you might have as a person. But that needs to be carefully done and we're looking at some safeguards in relation to that. But it's important to note that it is you, the person who's making the Advanced Healthcare Directive, who gives that patient-designated representative the powers. So you can give them all the powers in the world to make as many decisions as you want on your behalf, or you can limit them and say, no, 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 not anything to do with life-sustaining treatment. Um, but anything to do with more minor issues, yes, I'm happy for them to do. So again, you're in control. And then we come to the resolution of conflicts, because unfortunately, if all these things are done very, um, very well, we hope that there won't be too many conflicts, but unfortunately, um, uh, you know, you simply have to deal with that. Um, and we see conflicts arising in a number of different ways. So for example, if I make uh, my son my patient designated representative because he's always been the favorite and I feel he's more in tune with me and my daughter is extremely upset about that and suddenly decides, well, no, that's not what mommy would have wanted. And anyway, you know he's the favorite and he's in line four and that's why he wants to dispatch her rather quickly from the mortal coil. Um, there can be those kind of issues. There can also be issues around um, uh, uh, you know, where a doctor is reading something and they're not entirely clear whether what you actually meant or indeed you have said or done something in the meantime that's cast doubt over what you actually originally wrote. So we need to have a mechanism by where we can actually um, look at resolving those disputes. So in the first instance what we're saying is that the treating 
healthcare professionals should go and talk to the patient designated representative and if they don't if you don't if you haven't nominated somebody they should go and talk to your family to try and ascertain what you would have wanted not what they want but what you would have wanted and that they have to do some consultation in that respect if there's still a doubt over the applicability or the validity or what you actually wanted we have made a mechanism in the legislation whereby any interested party so that can be your doctor or it can be a family member or whatever can actually bring it to the high court so that there can be um, a resolution if you like at the at the judicial level in in trying to decide look was this valid was this applicable did the person have capacity so as i said we're currently in a in a phase of public consultation we would be, we've had actually a number of, of, of submissions from individuals who've had experiences of actually taking care of their loved ones and I have to say they haven't always been happy experiences and so they really feel had there been something like this in place it would have been an easier road. So we're really um, encouraging people, please do, if it's a one-liner, if it's a, you know, have you thought about what, you know, how people are going to get these into their medical records, have you thought about what if I get hit by a bus or all that sort of stuff that we hope we've thought of, but you know, we'd really be interested in hearing from you. So thank you so much for your time.